From Washington, D.C., this is the Muslim News on Muslim Network TV. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Hannah Zuberi. First, the headlines. Taliban offer wheat for jobs to tackle hunger and unemployment. Today marks the 20th anniversary of the controversial U.S. Patriot Act. EU urges Israel to halt construction of new settlements. Grand jury indicts man for random attacks on Muslims. Investigation into the Christchurch massacre of Muslims begins again. Milwaukee Muslim Film Festival offers a glimpse into life of global Muslim community. Our top story tonight. Afghanistan's Taliban government launched a program Sunday to tackle hunger offering thousands of people wheat in exchange for labor. Taliban chief spokesman Zabihullah Mujahid said that the scheme will be rolled out in major towns and cities and employ 40,000 men in the capital, Kabul. The Taliban's food for work scheme will pay laborers in wheat instead of cash. It targets those currently unemployed and most at risk of starvation during the winter. In two months, over 11,000 tons of wheat will be distributed in Kabul, with 55,000 tons earmarked for elsewhere in the country. A report in Christianity Today claims tens of thousands of Afghans disillusioned with Islam are turning towards Christianity for answers. Michael Christian, who leads a small congregation called Afghan American Church of the Bay Area, says that the younger generation, especially women, are most disenchanted with Islam. Christian says he has received text messages, emails, WhatsApp messages, and phone calls from Afghanistan. Many Afghans are ready to denounce their faith and become followers of Jesus, he said in an interview with Christianity Today. Christian claims to be engaged with 30,000 Afghans on what he calls the Lord's mission. California is home to more than 60,000 Afghans. More evacuees will be resettled there than in any other state. Today marks the 20th anniversary of the controversial Patriot Act. The law was hastily passed by the U.S. Congress just 45 days after the 9-11 attacks in the name of national security. It led to the first of many changes in surveillance laws that made it easier for the government to spy on ordinary Americans. According to the American Civil Liberties Union, or ACLU, it also reduced checks and balances on powers. These include judicial oversight, public accountability, and the ability to challenge government searches in court. For the Muslim community, it marked much greater use of profiling, surveillance, and secret evidence by law enforcement and courts to target them. According to Mike Rollins, a former FBI official in charge of counterterrorism, at the time, the FBI interviewed 500,000 Muslim and Arab men between 2001 and 2005. A school founded by evangelist Jerry Falwell ignored reports of rape and threatened to punish accusers for breaking its moral code, according to a report by ProPublica a Liberty University official who claims that he was fired for raising concerns, calls it a conspiracy of silence, according to the investigation. Interviews with more than 50 former students and employees, as well as records from more than a dozen cases, show how an ethos of sexual purity has silenced voices. School officials accused of discouraging, dismissing, and even blaming female students who have tried to come forward with claims of sexual assault. Abstinence before marriage is central to the Liberty Way, known in evangelical communities as the purity culture. A New York grand jury has indicted a man for random attacks on Muslims last summer. Naveed Durni was arranged Friday in Queen's Supreme Court. He faces eight counts of robbery, assault as a hate crime, menacing as a hate crime, aggravated harassment, and criminal possession of a weapon. In three separate incidents, Durni allegedly pursued people he believed were Muslim. He struck them and yelled anti-Muslim slurs, according to Queen's District Attorney, Melinda Katz. Durni is accused of striking a 31-year-old man without provocation and pulling on a 24-year-old woman's hijab. 
while the couple was walking on the street. He also allegedly harassed another couple yelling anti-Muslim slurs and then punching the 56-year-old woman in the face and head. Lastly, Durni allegedly bumped a 30-year-old woman into street traffic. Sara Hubeishi, a third-year law student at Washington University School of Law in St. Louis, has been elected inaugural chair of the National Muslim Law Student Association. The organization was recently established as a subcommittee of the National Association of Muslim Lawyers. As chair, Hubeishi is responsible for planning its annual conference. She'll be coordinating with the National Muslim Lawyers Association, regional bar associations, and Muslim law students. Obeshi is a first-generation law student and a Toronto native. She's been involved with the Student Bar Association, the Honor Council, the Dean's Advisory Council, and the Black Law Students Association. The European Union on Monday called on the Israeli government to halt the construction of new settlements. Tel Aviv recently announced plans to move on the construction of thousands of new settlement homes. EU Foreign Policy Chief Joseph Borrell said that the settlements were in violation of international law and obstruct a two-state solution. The EU has said it would not recognize any change of the deal in which both sides agreed regarding the pre-1967 borders, including Jerusalem. Nearly a year after a high-level commission inquiry ended, New Zealand's chief coroner has begun a new investigation into a massacre at two Christchurch mosques. Judge Deborah Marshall said she had unanswered questions about the massacre of 51 Muslims during Friday prayers on March 15, 2019. The man responsible for the terror attacks, Australian Brenton Taranton, was sentenced in August 2020 to life in prison without the chance of parole. After initially denying guilt, the 30-year-old admitted to all charges against him 51 counts of murder, 40 attempted murder, and one of terrorism. Most of the details of the mass shooting never became public. Ten Western envoys in Turkey pledged to abide by Article 41 of Vienna's Convention on Diplomatic Relations, which prohibits envoys from interfering in the internal affairs of states. The move came after embassies in Turkey last week called for the release of Osman Kavala. He's a Turkish businessman imprisoned over his alleged role in the 2013 Rezi Park protests and riots. Countries announcing their compliance on Monday were the United States, Canada, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Finland, Germany, and France. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan welcomed the declarations by the embassies according to a presidential source. A group of seven young volunteers in Iraq's capital, Baghdad, is trying to instill hope through colorful murals on the walls of houses in the war-ravaged ancient city. Volunteers with the team Butterfly Trail travel across various districts every day, changing the face of dilapidated structures. They depict Baghdad folklore and history in their work. Its members also decorated the capital with paintings portraying the fight against COVID-19. Team founder Ali Khalifa told Anadalu Agency, the group began working on this project four years ago. Khalifa said the paintings they recreated on walls bearing the traces of past violence on the street of Baghdad have special meaning. He stressed that the team wanted to leave a mark with their artwork. The Serbian presidency member Milorad Dodik claims that the United States embassy in Sarajevo is working towards turning Bosnia into a Muslim state. Dodik's comments were prompted by U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary Gabriel Escobar's recent visit to Sarajevo. Dodik stressed that the United States is pushing the Muslim project of Bosnia while presenting that they're allegedly creating a functional state. Though they had started withdrawal of an entity from a state institution, this move violated the Dayton Peace Agreement. The U.S. has said they will sanction anyone who goes against this treaty. The Milwaukee Muslim Film Festival, returning for its sixth year, aims to spark conversations about the Muslim community and the Muslim world. Festival founder 
Janan Najib said art is a common language amongst people. Eight films will be shown over four days. The goal is to share and tell the stories of Muslims around the world through a lens that captures their struggles, triumphs, and perseverance. Amongst the films featured this year is City of Ali. It is a documentary about how the death of Muhammad Ali brought the people of his Kentucky hometown and the world together for one unforgettable week. Coming up next after the break is our in-depth analysis segment on Afghanistan. So stay tuned and we'll be right back after these messages. I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. If we could find a way to get inside each other's minds walk a mile in my shoes walk, walk a mile, mile in my shoes. my shoes well before you abuse criticize and accuse walk, walk a mile in my shoes there are 16 million children struggling with hunger in america that's one in five daughters sons neighbors and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Despite the development of a COVID-19 vaccine, millions around the world will not have access. We need a vaccine that's free and available to everyone, everywhere. It's time for a people's vaccine. Our fellow Americans. Right now, the COVID-19 vaccines are available to millions of Americans. And soon, they will be available to everyone. The science is clear. These vaccines will protect you and those you love from this dangerous and deadly disease. They could save your life. So we urge you to get vaccinated when it's available to you. That's the first step to ending the pandemic and moving our country forward. It's up to you. I am what hunger looks like in America. I am an eight-year-old girl who's not excited for the last day of school because this may be the last time I'll have lunch till September. I am a single father of two who works three part-time jobs, and that's still not enough to put food on the table. I was created by artificial intelligence from faces of the one in eight Americans who struggle with hunger. Feeding America, 200 food banks strong. took over my bedroom. Come on, come on. Okay, Dad. One, two, three. Ah! Dad! You saved me. Dad? Are you okay? I'm fine, dear. Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org caregiving. Welcome back. To discuss the current humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan, let's go to Imam Abdul Malik Mujahid. Over to you, Imam Mujahid. Thank you, Hina. Today we'll be talking with someone who is right now in Kabul, Afghanistan. Uh, news is coming here and news is focused on two things, uh, women's right, uh, as well as uh, uh, that nobody is getting their salaries in Afghanistan and what's gonna happen over there. So these are the conversations. So we have someone uh, who is Associate Professor of Law and Political Science in the faculty of Salam University, which is based in Kabul, uh, Professor Hamza Momin Hakimi. Assalamu alaikum and thank you for having me. 
So tell us, everyone in America is saying uh, women education is not possible in Afghanistan. Are women attending classes at your university? Uh, about uh, women education in Afghanistan, uh, the universities which are in private sector, the private sector universities which are the majority of universities in Afghanistan, more than 150 universities are active in Afghanistan in private sector, they are fully uh, uh, operational and they are uh, holding classes for both women, men and women in Afghanistan. Though there is a problem in uh, uh, state universities or uh, government universities, basically the main problem that the government is facing for running the universities is financial and also administrative uh, problems. Uh, as the government officials, the uh, caretaker government uh, uh, of Afghanistan officials state <clears throat> that they are uh, trying to make rules and regulations to separate classes in the universities between men and women, and then they are going to start the universities. As far as uh, it is related to the schools, uh, the girls' schools are started uh, till uh, class, si class sixth. After the class six till class 12, it's not yet started. Uh, but in a couple of uh, provinces, like Mazar and one other province in northern, Af northern Afghanistan, but in Kabul, the capital Kabul, and other major cities, the schools of girls after 6th class to 12th class, it has not yet started. Uh, and that also, again, because the rules and the regulations that are going to be made for regulating the educations. And uh, in order to understand the situation in Afghanistan, we have to know that Afghanistan is, uh, as a state is not in a normal situation. We uh, are facing an, not in a situation that we have lost our government. The whole state fell apart. And uh, uh, Taliban took over a failed state, uh, a, a demolished state at all. So they are facing much larger, much bigger uh, issues right now, and which they are suffering to deal with. One of them is education for girls. And of course, it is a part of their um, ideology also. They have a strict lines for uh, women and girls uh, um, being active as a part of the society. They have uh, some ideological problems with that. I cannot uh, ignore that as well. So tell us, are there private schools uh, where uh, girls can study and go to classes beyond sixth grade? Uh, lower than sixth uh, grade, not higher than sixth grade. And uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, private schools which are uh, solely and wholly for girls, and the teachers are also women. They are active now and they are receiving uh, students. Yes. Okay, so how many are girls' school, dedicated girls' high schools in Kabul, which where girls are able to study? Uh, if you're asking about the numbers, I don't have the exact statistics about the uh, girls in Afghanistan schools. Uh, but it is certainly lower in percentage than uh, boys. It is uh, about uh, 35, 65 percentage of girls and boys used to be in previous government during the American existence in Afghanistan. 35, 65 percentage. Now tell us this. Uh, one of the issue being in the paper is most people have not been paid for last uh, four months, and that seems to be before Taliban even took over. So what is the situation of salaries of people? Uh, would you mind sharing with us if you have been paid in the last four months? Uh, since I am a, uh, a lecturer or professor in a private university, I continue my uh, classes and I also receive my salaries. Uh, as, as it far as it related to me as a person. But in Afghanistan, yes, there is a big issue and a big problem in salaries of the government sectors, uh, especially in the health, health sector. People did not get their salaries even three months before the collapse of the previous government. Previous government, I don't know why and how they did not pay for a lot of the sectors, uh, public sectors in uh, the government did not pay uh, to the government employees. And that problem uh, uh, increased when Taliban took over Kabul in all Afghanistan. Uh, though they have started paying uh, partially uh, for the last month for a large number of uh, employees in government, different sectors, for example, the employees working directly in the presidential office, which is now the office of the prime minister, the acting prime minister, and also some, some of the ministries, some of the ministries, I, I cannot say, 
the exact ratio or the percentage of the people receiving salaries right now, but they have started distributing salaries. I know I have information about salaries for the people, especially the women who used to work in the Supreme Court in Afghanistan judicial system, Ministry of Urban Development. They have started uh, paying some salaries for the last couple of months, the presidential palace or the office of the prime minister in Afghanistan. In the uh, health sector, they have started paying salaries. So they are starting uh, slowly paying salaries, but there is a big issue. So is the attendance uh, uh, of the university, sir, you're saying that most universities are private universities. Has the attendance at the university has gone down overall or especially for women? Um, the attendance at, at universities, uh, especially the uh, the, uh, the government's university has not started yet. In the uh, private universities, uh, unfortunately, the attendance is affected because uh, private universities are run by fees, this uh, fee that the students pay. And since the economic situation of Afghanistan is uh, in a very bad situation, people have economic problems, economic fears, and they are not able to pay, uh, most of the people, they are not able to pay fees anymore. So there are a huge uh, decrease in the number of the students attending classes, uh, especially the new um, entries, the new admissions in the university. Uh, a month back, it was a season of the new uh, admissions in the university, and there was a huge decrease, uh, maybe 10 to 15 percent of the students who are getting admissions yearly in my university, they took admission this year only. There is a decline of about uh, 10 to 20 percent in people attending the universities then. I said the new admissions are only up to 10 to 15 percent of the people. So it means a decline in new admissions up to 80 percent or 85 percent. But in attendance, uh, you know, people are attending who used to be our previous uh, students, they are attending universities uh, in, in a ratio of 70 to 80 percent. There is an impression in America that uh, everybody from Afghanistan loves America and they want to move to America. Uh, is that true about all population or some of the people who wants to move to America? At least it's not true about me or people uh, who are working with me in Salam University of Teachers. But uh, in order to understand the situation properly, let us uh, elaborate, let us say that Americans or American troops left Afghanistan after 20 years of what we consider to be occupation in Afghanistan. And the Afghan people are 70 percent, more than 70 percent are below the poverty line. It means less than two dollars for a family in in a day. So this is a situation of Afghanistan American left. Uh, so if there a will or a desire between Afghans to leave Afghanistan, that is not because of the political problems or that's not because of the fear they have of, on their own lives. That's because of the economic problem that we are in as a nation in Afghanistan. The economic problem or the crisis that we inherited from American existence in Afghanistan. The scenes that we saw in the evacuation days or the last days of American existence in Kabul airport, those scenes, all the people are not running for their lives. The people are living normal lives in Afghanistan apart than the economic crisis that we are living now. People are feeling safe after 40 years of, of blood uh, shed in Afghanistan, after 40 years of war in Afghanistan, we are feeling safe. Once again, there is no war, there is no uh, uh, killing in Afghanistan. But people are running away, people desire to go out of Afghanistan because of the economic situation. And I can say that it's not wholly on, on, on Taliban, or it's not their responsibility uh, maybe partially their responsibility, but this economic crisis we inherited from American existence in Afghanistan. I was reading in Christianity Today. Christianity Today is a evangelical uh, magazine, highly respected uh, in America. Uh, they interviewed uh, several people who are Christian missionaries. About 50 Christian missionaries have developed, organizations have developed an alliance and they're trying to help Afghans. So one of them says that Afghans want to leave Islam. And he, one Christian missionary says that he is in touch with 30 Afghans who uh, are looking to uh, find Jesus and have questions about Christianity and say that they want to leave Islam. 
Now, this is not a, a, a lost magazine. This is a respected magazine in America. What are your thoughts about that? Uh, so a lot of these studies are known to be biased uh, and we, we're pretty sure and we know how the media in these study centers work. They take a really small part of the picture and then zoom in into that and that makes it a full picture of Afghanistan. That's not true. They might have found uh, 30 Afghans that who for some reasons, for some uh, uh, migration reasons or making their cases, they, they would say that they want to leave Islam. but. Let's not forget that Americans were here for 20 years in Afghanistan and with other 48 uh, mostly Christian uh, country forces in Afghanistan. <clears throat> Afghans did not turn into Christians in all these days. Uh, there were tens of uh, organizations that were working in Afghanistan actively to propagate for Christianity in Afghanistan, missionary organizations. They were, they were giving, they were, they were spending millions of hundreds of millions of dollars in Afghanistan for this cause. But we don't have a Christian population in Afghanistan. Not, I'm talking, I'm not talking about now, I'm talking about the existence of America. In the days they were occupying our country, there were no Christian minority in Afghanistan. No one that we know that they are Christian. There might be some Afghans who want to create their cases for migration in some of European countries or, or maybe USA to turn into Christians not to be deported back from one of the European countries. That does not count and they do not represent Afghan people or Afghanistan uh, people. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Hamza Hakimi of Salam University, who is coming to us right from Kabul, Afghanistan. Thank you so much. Salam alaikum. Thank you. Back to you, Hina. Thank you so much, Imam Mujahid. And that was Hamza Muin Hakimi, Associate Professor of Law at Kabul University. That's all from our Washington studios tonight. Thank you for tuning in. You can find previous episodes and more on our YouTube or Facebook. For more content, keep watching Muslim Network TV or visit muslimnetwork.tv. Assalamu alaikum and good night.